Hello and welcome to the Gen3 webinar series. This is the fourth Gen3 webinar hosted by the Center for Translational Data Science here at the University of Chicago. My name is Devin Grant Kane. I am a technical project manager here at CTDS, and I'll be hosting the webinar today, which consists of a presentation followed by a Q&A session. The presentation, which will be done by Elin Shu. Elin is a senior bioinformatician at CTDS. The presentation will focus on how you can use Gen3 Data Commons to perform scientific data analysis. Throughout the webinar, your, uh, your phone will be muted. So if you have any questions at any time, go ahead and open that Q&A box in the bottom of your Zoom meeting and go ahead and enter your questions. During the Q&A session, we'll go through and we'll answer those questions. If you have any technical issues, then please use the chat box. So with that, I will hand it over to Elin to start the presentation. Thanks, Devin. I'm very excited to be presenting today. Now I'm going to share my slides. OK, let's get started. The title for today's topic is Data Science in Gen 3. We will focus on using Jupyter Notebooks in Gen 3 for data analysis. We have introduced the data modeling in Gen 3 a month ago in the previous webinar. The Gen 3 data model is flexible and able to host the data to be analyzed in different fields. In this webinar, we will speak about using Gen 3 for data analysis in general and show an example of Gen 3 used for precision medicine. Firstly, I will give you an overview of big data in precision medicine and the Gen3 ecosystem. Precision medicine or personalized medicine does not follow a one-size-fits-all treatment approach, but emphasizes a tailor-made paradigm, meaning a treatment is customized to each individual person's case based on the person's information, including genomics and omics, lifestyle, preferences, health history, and so on and so forth. For patients, this increases the chance of treatment success and means fewer side effects. While the approach originates in the field of oncology, it is now also increasingly applied to other disease patterns. Nowadays, trending research in biomedical science juxtaposes the term precision medicine and the public health with the company words like big data data science, and the deep learning. Technological advancements permit the collection and the merging of large heterogeneous data sets from different resources. From day-to-day -day data, including electronic health records, social media posts, wearables, and from medical data, such as electrocardiogram, X-ray, and MRI. Additionally, complex algorithms supported by high-performance computing, allow one to transform this large data set into knowledge, the emerging knowledge to make informative decisions and ultimately improve health care. Driven by high-throughput omics technologies and the computational search, it enables systemic exploration of complex interactions in biological systems. Interactive analysis of genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and so on provides insightful overview of regulatory network in cells, organisms, and the population. Data commons co-locate data, including all the types of data we talked in precision medicine. Storage and the computing infrastructure with commonly used software services, tools, apps for analyzing and sharing data to create a resource for the research community. Currently, Gen3 team has built multiple data commons using Gen3 technology, including NHLBI Data Stage, NIIS Data Hub, Kids First Data Resources, and other data commons from different foundations. Data stored in different commons has different 
Brenda has similar data model and the share same microservices, forming a Gen3 ecosystem that can be potentially explored for data analysis across data commons. In Gen3 ecosystem, users submit data using tools provided by Gen3 or customized by users for importing, cleaning, and curating data. Data was stored in object-based cloud storage and managed in Data Commons framework services in secure environments. Gen3 ecosystem developed the tools for exploring, integrating, analyzing, and simulating data, including data portal, workspaces, notebooks, apps, and simulations to facilitate the scientists make data-driven discovery. Now we will focus on talking about using Jupyter Notebook for data science with Gen3. The outline includes build a notebook in Gen3, select virtual work cohorts in data portal, notebook example, and introduce the coming feature for data analysis. Notebooks combine annotation, code, and output visualization. In this example, the first line annotates the purpose of the function is to get field distribution for one variable. On the second line, the function is called with several parameters, and the histogram is plotted in the notebook. The count distribution for alcohol use score follows Poisson distribution. Gen3 currently supports Jupyter Notebooks for a lightweight workspace. An authorized user's workspace in a given common includes a persistent drive in which analysis notebooks, scripts, data files, etc. are saved and persist even at logout. Gen3 Jupyter Notebooks support both R and Python language. User documentation is available in this URL. Gen3 team also developed Gen3 SDK to facilitate data analysis in notebooks by providing the library to make calls to Gen3 API easier. This part is covered in the last webinar. You can also read the documentation linked in the URL list in this page. After you launch the Data Commons homepage, you may click the Workspace button. Then you have the option to start your server in Gen3. After clicking, you will see the sound option as shown on the right corner. You are asked to choose a virtual machine flavor with the appropriate memory and the computer space space required for your analysis. As a Gen3 Data Common Operator, you have the freedom to configure different flavors based on the resources available to you, your user community's needs, and what price you are willing to pay. The notebook runs in a container image that is deployed by Kubernetes. The tools and the packages in the container are available to anyone selecting the flavor. Here is an example Docker file for notebook Docker image. The Docker file is, based, uh, is shared in GitHub, and the Docker image is built in Quay from the Docker file. In this example, the Docker is built from the base image, SciPy notebook. On the right is the manifest file for this comment. The manifest file declares the settings for Gen3 microservices. In this example, the notebook has three flavors, and the manifest file specifies the flavor name, CPU, memory, and the Docker image. Once you select and spawn the notebook, you come into the notebook interface. If you would like to use an existing notebook and the library, you can upload any necessary reference files needed for analysis your workspace. You can also upload Python or R library in addition to Jupyter Notebook. You will be able to access clinical data and object data by using Gen3 SDK. 
However, you can also write notebook and library from scratch in the workspace. On the right corner of the notebook interface, you will see the new button. By clicking the button, you can choose Start working in Python or R notebook, or write your library in text format. Once you select the notebook, you can start writing code in the cell as shown in the right picture. If you need to access data in your data commons from notebook, you need to load your API key in your notebook to receive temporary access token and send it to Gen3 API to access data in the comments. So first, you need to create API keys. The API keys are valid for a month, and it is used to receive temporary access tokens that is valid for only 30 minutes. The generated access token must be sent to Gen3 API to access data in the comments. You can retrieve your API key in profile endpoint as shown in the right picture. By clicking Create API key, you can download the credential the JSON file. Then upload the file to workspace to allow you to access data within your comments. One thing to pay attention, be sure your API credential JSON matches the name as you call it in your notebook. This is an R notebook from Gen3 Data Commons. The dependent library is microbind R. In the first step, we source the dependent library. Therefore, the functions written in microbind R is available in R notebook. You can select code you would like to run, and then hit the run button to execute. On the right panel, it shows the output from executing the code. It's a visualization of box plot comparing channel diversity index between trimesters post-delivery in two studies. This notebook example showcases Jupyter Notebook combines code, narrative, and output in one interface. While running notebook, sometimes you may realize you want to tune the source code and rerun the Jupyter Notebook. One can click the interrupt button to stop the notebook from running and make changes in the source code. Once the source code is updated, you can turn back to Jupyter Notebook and restart clean output from the previous run. The notebook will use the updated source code. After the notebook and the dependent library is developed, it's worthwhile to share the notebook with the collaborator or with the community. Therefore, collaborators or other members in the community can review and give feedback on the method. Other scientists can use your analysis on different data based on their access. Sharing notebooks can also accompany publications for reproducible research. Here are several suggestions pertaining sharing notebook. We suggest remove results before sharing and utilize GitHub repository for community access for notebooks with associated files and libraries. One can also use shared notebook in his notebook for data analysis. Just upload all the dependent files with notebook and ensure the credential the JSON is current in your workspace. We explained how to access data in notebook using Gen3 SDK. Now I will introduce an alternative way for data access in notebook. Recently, Gen3 team enables virtual cohort selection in data portal and export, export object files in notebook. On the left, you define your cohort by selecting the appropriate criteria by clicking the checkbox. The number of files reflects how many files are associated with your selected cohort. On the upper panel, it shows your selection criteria. You can remove the criteria either from the checkbox or from the panel. Once 
you are satisfied with your cohort selection, you can click the export button to workspace and then object file are mount in your workspace. After complete mount, mounting the object file, you can click the go to workspace button. In the notebook interface as shown on the right, you can see the data folder. The mounted data is organized and the manifest folder with the name containing cohort selection time and the by GUID folder. The files are saved with the name as its global uniquely identified ID, GUID. You can also download the clinical file and then upload in the workspace. The clinical information for each file named by its GUID is available in the clinical file. One can then use the clinical information with the object file for data analysis in notebook. In summary, there are four steps to use notebook in Gen3. Firstly, select virtual machine flavor required for your analysis. Then import API key and upload or write reference file, library, and the Jupyter notebook. After that, you can use Gen3 SDK for data access in notebook, or you can select a virtual cohort from data portal and import clinical and object data in virtual machine to run the notebook and tune the library. Lastly, you can share your notebook with your community. So far, we explained how to work with the notebook in Gen3. Now let's look at an example of data analysis using notebook. In this example, we analyze brain MRI image to get average cortical thickness measurements in different regions. Then we visualize brain surface segmented into different regions. Finally, we compare the cortical thickness across groups of patients with different brain disease. On the right is the raw brain MRI image visualized from axial, sagittal, and the coronal plane. Here are the steps to measure the cortical thickness. From the original structure image, the image with the scar is removed. The border of the cortical gray matter is then delimited and the thickness of the cortical gray matter is measured. The thickness of each cortical region is averaged. In this example, we implemented preserver Enigma pipeline for cortical thickness measurement. The command is record all. There are three steps for processing the MRI image. Firstly, it normalizes brain signal intensity through skull stripping white matter and the gray matter segmentation and the delineation of the gray-white interface. Secondly, the surface is divided into separate cortical regions. Lastly, the surface area and the mean cortical thickness was extracted for each of the 68 regions, 34 per hemisphere. We added the free server tools and the dependent script in Docker image of the Jupyter Hub. And we found the workspace by selecting the flavor with free server. Now let's do a live demo for the example notebook. So in this example notebook, we first import the library DHC analysis function. This library has the pipeline function and the GraphQL queries. This is the library we wrote for running the example notebook. We also imported our credentials. The matplotlib in line defines the output of plotting. It's displayed in line within front end in the Jupyter notebook, directly below the code cell that produced it. The clinical data and the function MRI images for this notebook is imported from UCLA consortium for neuropsychiatric phenomics LA 5C study. The data is imported in project DHC CMP Open FMRI 
in Gen3 data comments. By running function get disease cohort for this project, it shows the cohort breakdown by disease. In this study, it has 130 healthy individuals with 50 schizophrenia, 49 bipolar disorder, and 43 ADHD patients. Then we select one subject in this project and run the preserver pipeline for Enigma cortical sickness measurement. This step takes more than seven hours to process the raw image, to label cortical region, and calculate the cortical thickness by region. Then we run the extract cortical measure function to extract the average thickness and the surface area per cortical region and save in CSV format. This table shows the average thickness for the 68 cortical regions for this individual. And the, the next table shows the average surface area for the 68 cortical regions for this individual, as shown here. The last step is to perform gyra labeling as a QC step. By calling the run external segmentation function, it extracts the, the surface segmentation and the pestilation for this subject and outputs the visualization of the brain image from the view of the external surface and the median plane. Different cortical regions are colored in different colors. The upper panel shows the visualization of the left hemisphere and the button is the right hemisphere. The more distinct the regions are separated, the higher quality the image is. After processing all the individual images for the 270 individuals, we compare the overall intracranial volume, cortical surface area, and the cortical thickness for the entire cohort by disease against health individuals. We are concoct rank some statistical tests is applied to determine the significance at 0.05 type 1 hair. We first compare the intracranial volume between health and the disease groups. The box plot with the p-value shows there's no significant difference between the healthy and the disease group. Next, we compare the cortical surface area there is also no significant difference between the healthy and the disease group. Lastly, cortical thickness is compared. The cortical thickness between the healthy and the schizophrenia groups are significantly different. The mean cortical thickness in schizophrenia group is much lower than the healthy individuals. This is the end of the demo. Now I would like to mention several other features Gen3 team is developing to help scientists for data analysis in Gen3. Additional tools for the workspace includes R Studio Notebook, Galaxy, and more. Gen3 will also enable clinical data export to workspace to avoid download and upload process. Excitingly, Gen3 will provide workflow execution service. The Gen3 workflow execution service will use its own CWL engine developed in-house to execute workflows. User will pass the CWL workflow, which is tagged as a JSON file. With a JSON file specifying workflow input to the workflow execution service API for running the pipeline. There are several, uh, there are additional resources to help you start working with Gen3, including UCCD's GitHub, Gen3.org documentation, Gen3 community on Slack, data comment support, and the CDTS website. Here are several examples of comments we built using Gen3 technology. Our next webinar will be on August 8th 
at 1 p.m. Please join us at that time to dive into more features in Gen 3. Now I'm going to stop here and jump into the Q&A session. All right, thank you so much, Elin. Now we will transition into our Q&A session. Um, I see some questions in the Q&A box. If you have any more questions, feel free to use that and just send them right in and we will take them. Joining us for the Q&A is one of the technical leads on the CTDS team, Zach Flaming. All right, so we've got some questions flowing in here through the Q&A box. Our first question, where is the physical data located? At the University of Chicago, is that where the notebooks are? So the uh, user notebooks are also run in the cloud. Um, so that may be on Amazon or on Google or on Azure or uh, on an on-prem instance. Uh, it depends on where you're actually running Gen3. So the, the storage is generally located in the same place as the, the rest of the commons. So it depends on where it's set up at. Next question. Can I bring my own additional data sets to combine with the Gen 3 data sets? You absolutely can. So I think Gillen described a little bit of that process, but you are more than welcome to uh, upload your own data to the, the Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so there's the ability in Jupyter to, to upload data, and you can do that. Um, you can also submit your data more formally to the Commons if it's a data set you think you'd want to publish uh, in the future, and uh, the Commons allows for that. Okay. We got two questions about uh, compute and costs. So, what compute options are available uh, in terms of power, CPU, operating system, memory, and are there associated costs? And similarly, how do users get billed for their notebook use? Great. So, <clears throat> right now, the uh, Jupyter notebook instances are backed by the VMs on the various cloud providers. So, whatever VMs the uh, cloud provider has available, you can actually use to run uh, Jupyter Notebooks if that's something you desire in your commons. Uh, so for example, you can get on Amazon, you can get, um, you can set up node tools to run the Jupyter Notebooks on to support GPUs for deep learning. Uh, you can also support high memory instances uh, if you have very large, uh, if you have a need for very large amounts of memory. Uh, what was the second part of the question? Yeah, are the, what are the associated costs and uh, or how do use, users get built? Right. So right now, uh, generally the costs are borne by the, the commons, and so um, you know we're working on developing in Gen3 in collaboration with the cloud service providers the capability to do uh, various models for actually charging the, the users for the computes they use. Um, so it's a little bit tricky, and all of the uh, commons are taking a different stance on that. So we're working with each of them individually, and so you sort of have the option if you want to do chargeback or credit uh, for the users for the, the cost of running the notebook. Exactly. Another question we have is, what is the advantage of using a Jupyter Notebook within Gen 3 as opposed to on your local machine? Right. So the, the main advantage is that you're going to be local to the data that's available in the Commons. And so you don't have to pull down the data from the Commons to your local laptop to be able to work with it when you're running the Jupyter uh, in the Commons in the cloud environment. Um, so, you know, you're still pulling from S3, but that's a, a local link on the the common size is going to be a very fast uh, connection versus if you're trying to do this locally, you'll have to pull the data down to your local laptop. It'll be subject to sort of the, the internet feeds there. Um, so that's just from a, a data perspective for the users, from a common operator perspective, uh, you're also forcing the data to stay in the cloud, so it's much more secure. Uh, so the data it isn't on the local laptop, you're not at risk of losing the data if the laptop is stolen or something like that. Great. All right, can we make an R notebook? Dylan, that one's for you. You've done R, right? Yes. Uh, in our example, we showed one R and one Python notebook. We have the option to uh, to uh, to run R and Python notebook. And in the future, we will enable more options. We will be able to run R Studio and Galaxy in the Gen3 uh, platform. Thanks, Elin. Uh, what about other analysis tools like TensorFlow? Sure. So that goes back to sort of what I was mentioning uh, on the previous question about uh, the compute resources that are available. So I did mention, you know, you are able, if you want to do TensorFlow, to also have uh, GPU-based instances as well, so that you can utilize them for even faster machine learning. Um, so there's no problem supporting uh, tools like TensorFlow inside the Jupyter Notebook. 
uh, we'll have some examples where we show that uh, various things probably in the next few months. Okay, it looks like we just have one more question. So if I do analysis on Gen 3 within a Jupyter Notebook, how do I reference my analysis and data in a publication? Right, so the, the data you use uh, in your analysis can only reference if it's data from the commons. It can be referenced by the, the GUIs that are attached to it uh, in the commons. I think you'll uh, reference that a little bit. And so we are going to expose externally sort of landing pages for each of the GUIs so that you can actually facilitate sort of the publication that way. Um, and then another feature that we're working on for sort of the, the future of Gen 3 is the ability to mint DOIs for sort of data sets and analysis and data collection so that you'd be able to more commonly publish those and have an easier time when you're actually submitting to the journal and going through the review process. Fantastic. Thank you, Zach. And thank you, Elin. That is going to wrap up our Q&A session for today. So uh, if you have any additional questions, things that come up after the fact, you can always reach us at gen3.org or ctds.uchicago.edu. Um, after the webinar today, we will be sharing a recording of the webinar on YouTube. So if you want to go back and watch Elon's presentation, refresh yourself on any Q&As, or share the webinar, you'll be able to do so. And we will also share a link for the next webinar, which Elon mentioned will be on August 8th. So that concludes our webinar for today. Thanks, Elon. Thanks, Zach. And see everyone on August 8th.